Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. One of, we were talking earlier about the fact that one of the benefits of the pandemic is we did not have to make 25 phone calls this morning to reschedule and figure out the traffic. So I'm really happy to have people here. Um, we have a lot to talk about and we have a wonderful speaker this morning as well. And then we're gonna give some time to the folks from Belmont to talk a little bit about what's been happening there. Um, so although we usually spend a lot of time doing introductions and new people, I don't wanna take that time away from where we are. So what I'm gonna ask is if there are people who are here who are new, if you wouldn't mind just adding, introducing yourself in the chat, I think that will move things along a little bit. Um, and let us get through our business for this morning. I want to um, begin by talking about one piece, which I'm going to be asking, we will distribute asking for people's support on, and that is we are filing a bill with Senator Cream and Representative Barber with respect to the hate crime statute. And it is to fill a real gap in the statute, which has caused us not to be able to charge many of those crimes. So as some of you might know, chapter 265, section 39A is what's known as the hate crime legislation. And that punishes any damage to the real or personal property of a person that is done with the intention to intimidate someone because of any discriminatory matter, um, race, religion, sexual orientation, national origin, any of those things. So that sounds pretty straightforward. The gap which has made it impossible for us to, not to prosecute many cases is that a person has to be the owner of the property. So if I go and spray paint racist slurs on the fence of a person's house, facing a family that is of whatever race or ethnicity with the clear intent that they see it and be intimidated because when they walk out their front door, they are seeing that racial, racial slur on the fence across the street. They don't own that fence. So we can't prosecute that. So that has come up to us a number of times. Um, people are living in communities, maybe they're renting and their front door is being spray painted, but they don't own the home. So this would change this. Um, it would separate the hate crime from the ownership of property, right? And that is the same way right now, malicious destruction, it, oh, the property can be the property of another. So if I'm just mad at you and I come by and take a baseball bat to your mailbox, it doesn't matter whether you own or rent that house. But if I do it with the intent to intimidate you on some protected ground, it really does. So I think it's just a mistake. I think it's just something that people didn't think about in drafting the statute. So we're going to be asking in this amendment that it change that. And it will also require that if restitution is awarded, so I get convicted now of having spray painted the fence across the street from this family, Restitution is ordered. So $700 is ordered that I must pay to the person who owns that property. The person who gets that money will be required to fix the property. So I can't just decide I'm $700 richer. I'm not bothered by the fence because I'm looking at the backside of it. I don't have to repaint it. So the person who collects the restitution would be ordered to repair the damage to mitigate the suffering of the person that it was directed to. So we are gonna be filing this by the 19th and we'll be asking for support and asking people to reach out to their legislators for that support. Any questions about the bill or the purpose? I do, thank you so much, uh, DA Ryan. I, I just put a question in the chat here. Uh, would this cover an instance where, an, uh, where a homeowner puts up hateful things on their own property? I was thinking of particularly of an instance where a noose was put in front of a household to intimidate those who drive by. Um, I wanted to see if that would cover it. Oh, you're on mute, DA. Yes, it would, because right now they wouldn't be covered. If, if I live in a two family house right now and I'm the tenant, and the owner put some terrible thing in front of my door or whatever, we can't prosecute that. 
Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Let me know. It's when really, it's, it's important. It's just a common sense measure. And I'm particularly grateful to Senator Cream and Representative Barber for taking that on with us. We will circulate that bill as well as the fact sheet that kind of explains it in the numbers. So once they're filed on the 19th, you can reach out to your senators and representatives for support around that. Um, I want to talk for a moment about a couple of things that have happened since our last meeting. Um, we have seen an increasing number, particularly an incident in Marlboro where, and of course, we will talk later about the incident in Belmont, but where racial slurs are being used in the context of traffic incidents. We are being very vigilant about that and we're appropriate charging the right crime. So obviously we have a fender bender. I get out, I say a lot of things. I'm mad, you're mad. That's all fine. Increasingly those are including racial slurs. And we had one case um, involving a black woman and a, another woman in Marlboro, simple fender bender turned into a fight in the use of racial slurs. So we've charged in that case. Um, you may have seen that in Watertown, um, they have announced that they're going to have a task force to respond to claims of racial bullying in the schools. And they are as well asking that task force to do a full review of the school's bullying and disciplinary policies. And that brings us to our first speaker this morning. And this is someone who many of you may know, somebody that I have certainly learned a great deal from in this area and who's been a great help to us in a number of these situations. And that is Robert Treston, um, the executive director of the new regional director of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, Robert's an experienced civil rights advocate who has done a great job in developing community partnerships and initiatives to promote justice, equality, and fair treatment. And he started learning that as a public defender in Naples, Florida, and then came to Boston and spent more than a decade as the director of civil rights at the Boston Housing Authority before going to the ADL. Um, and he's done a lot of different jobs there. He led the league cyber hate response team, played really a leadership role in that job with the internet industry executives in Silicon Valley. He has represented the ADL to NGOs and governments abroad. Um, many of you know, he conducts a lot of foreign trips with respect to that and has really built a coalition in Massachusetts that helped to pass one of the most comprehensive anti-bullying statutes. He writes and appears often in the Boston Globe, the New York Times, NBC News. Um, he now directs the educational program for thousands of students. I've done lots of programs with Robert with students. We've done a great job um, bringing in soccer teams from across the world, meeting with kids. And that piece, as well as having really invested in our communities and knowing folks in those communities, building those relationships so you can call Robert when you need to talk those things through. And I know many people on this call have had the opportunity to do that. So I'm really happy to have him here today to talk a little bit about some of the things that have been going on, what we're seeing and thoughts moving forward. So Robert, thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, District Attorney Ryan. L like I was listening to um, DA Ryan sort of give you my, my, my life history. Like many of you, I've actually never worked in the for-profit world. I've only worked in, uh, in public spaces, uh, either nonprofit or working for a, a, a government agency. And I do think that um, the starting point for a little bit of discussion here is, is actually what is, is the point of this bill that uh, that we need because it actually speaks to some of what's happening in our communities and it also speaks to something that ADL has been tracking just sort of at the outset because we've tracked a tremendous increase in what I would sort of you know characterize as sort of the dissemination the trafficking of different forms of hate and it's not just the graffiti it's the flyers it's the stickers and I think sometimes we take things for granted, you know, in kind of Baloo, Massachusetts, but there are a lot of people who 
uh, are trafficking and um, inciting, encouraging others to uh, not just spread hate, but to actually act things out. And I think some of we're starting to see some of that play out. The you know before we sort of get into some of the actual examples, and I and I know we want to have a discussion about about Belmont. You know, incidents of hate, just statistically, so hate crimes uh, are the most underreported crime of any crime in, if you look at statistics in the United States, the, you know, you look at the crime stats, the FBI will tell you there were uh, probably about 7,600 and something. Um, we have a couple of chiefs joining us today. I don't know the exact number. It's around 7,600. It's plus or minus a few hundred uh, every single year. But to get a crime stat, somebody actually has to go and report something. Somebody has to call and do, you know, make a call to law enforcement. We have to rely on law enforcement, the officer responding to have actually been trained, put the right information in the report. Sometimes hate crimes just are reported as crimes, but maybe not the racial language, the racial epithets or the biased motive or the indicators. But what we do know, um, and I think probably everyone on this call knows, that most hate and bias that people experience just happens in day-to-day -day life, right? Like the schools. People experience different forms of racism, of anti-Semitism, of hate just going about their business. And that's where I think the biggest uh, focus and energy um, needs to be, because that's sometimes when they call uh, Chief someone on Chief McIsaac's team, they may not be able to make an arrest or even sort of do a whole investigation because it may not rise to the level of, of a criminal offense. And that's where there's a lot of work that needs to be done at the community level, at the community leadership level. And I, I would say, especially at the, at, at the school level. And so some of the things that are, are at least in our experience critical uh, is transparency. And if you look back over sort of a spectrum of time, you know, five, you know, five, five or more years ago, many, many schools were very defensive. We would get, you know, we're a clearinghouse for our office in Boston gets over 500 different types of like hate incidents every year that we're responding to. You call school and, you know, you know, maybe they would be public about it. Uh, always a little bit of resistance. I'm speaking generally here about sending a notice out to parents. Uh, for the, anyone who was at the meeting in Belmont the other night that I that I moderated a portion of, somebody, a, a parent actually asked a question and made reference to an incident that where there was some kind of, I don't even know what it was, some kind of offensive racial graffiti in a, bath, in a bathroom. And the parents said, I still don't know what, I still don't know what was actually said. And I think it's actually important for us, particularly the adults in the room, to be transparent about that. And I, I see Dr. Spicer from Framingham was on the call. And I know that when some things happened at the McCulloch School last year, uh, transparency was like at the top of the to-do list. And every parent knew exactly what happened in the school. They knew what the language was, they knew what the response was, and there was a community response. And in sort of my, you know, offline kind of discussions with some of the parents who were reaching out, that was like a big comfort to them. And so I think it's important for us as leaders to remember that the impact of these kind of incidents is different than any other type of thing that people experience because there is a sort of, there is a personal individual trauma and that may be the individual that was targeted, that may be the individual victim, but then there's a much bigger community impact. And we see that, you know, you know that's why it's important to let an entire school community know. That's why in the aftermath of, um, of Belmont, the community came together and they, they, they wanted answers. It was important for them to know exactly what happened. To, and, and now there's sort of a, you know, an action plan uh, that, that is forming around that. Um, in Bedford, a number of years ago, there were a number of anti-Semitic incidents and the entire community, uh, Chief Bongiorno played a, uh, a, a big role in that. 
and Rabbi Abramson in actually just convening a number of sessions and actually ha giving the community space to talk, to interact. And I think sometimes we're, you know, there's, there's a sort of natural fear of having some of these conversations. I think we're in a moment now when people are willing to take more risks and they're willing to actually uh, take a little bit, of, you know, exercise a little bit of personal courage to have some of those conversations. And I think it's really important that we provide the space, the public space for, um, for people to actually be, for them to be engaged. And I think that for most people, the vast majority, it comes from a space of wanting their communities to be stronger. And so it's important for us to be transparent. When hate comes up, and I'll tell you, even from our own perspective, it's sometimes like a two, you know, uh, you're trying to decide, you know, I'll get a call from the media about a, a banner that may be flying over an overpass or like the, um, and this has happened, I know Mayor Fuller, it's the, you know, there've been a number of these kind of incidents that have popped up in Newton. There's been a number that have happened like in the city in Boston where we see Patriot Front proud boys putting up flyers and signs uh, on Com Ave next to BU. And then there's a question of like, do you do, and this is something like I ask myself all the time, do you say no, like, I don't wanna publicly comment on that. I don't wanna give them any airtime. They want airtime, I don't wanna give them airtime. But then the flip side of that is people in the community should actually know that this is going on. And as leaders, we should be transparent with them. People should know that there are people in our midst who are putting up, you know, neo-Nazi flyers. People should know that there are groups that are infiltrating Black Lives Matter events. It happened all throughout the summer, by the way. Local people infiltrating BLM events all over the region, trying to instigate violence, trying to incite violence. The, you know, the same thing with sort of the, the, uh, the kind of counter protests. We saw, you know, um, Enrique Otario was arrested in Washington, D.C. for lighting a BLM uh, sign, you know, on fire in front of a, a, a black church. Well, many, many people in Massachusetts have had their BLM signs taken from their homes. Many, many people in Massachusetts have had all sorts of political signs taken from their homes and destroyed. And so I wouldn't underestimate any of those things. And I do think it's important for us to sort of recognize and engage the people in our communities and the leaders in our schools to be open about these conversations, to be open about what is going on. And at the end of the day, I think it makes our community stronger. And I would not judge uh, Belmont or even Bedford when it happened in Bedford years ago by virtue of something happening in that, in that place or in that town. It's actually how do the people come together in the aftermath? Because I can almost assure you that things will happen. We know that there are racists with, within our midst, and they will, they, will, they, will, they will act and they will do something. But it's important that the leadership uh, in those communities uh, respond, um, respond affirmatively. And I think that's, what, that's the kind of leadership that uh, people... Um, that people gravitate to. So I'm, I, I do wanna sort of open it up a little bit here because I, I think this is like something that touches every single person on the call. Uh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna cold call anyone. Um, well, maybe I'll just like give uh, Dr. Spicer an opportunity because you, I know in particular, and we, 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 we spoke at one point uh, about what was happening at the McAuliffe School and um, DA Ryan referenced the soccer players from England, would they actually went to Framingham too, by the way. Um, but that I think, you know, that, that I think engages uh, the people that you serve and they, they, they take that kind of leadership to heart. And I think it's, a, it's an important message. Thank you, Robin. Good to see you again. Uh, nice to see you. you know, 
just wanted to, you know, it, when we think about um, a community like Framingham that is quite diverse um, in many ways, and but uh, also quite insular in many ways, and how do we keep pushing the message of inclusiveness and diversity and and um, uh, you know anti-Semitism and so you know just recently and I know Mayor Fuller can attest we you know we get opportunities to sign on to uh, declarations and letters and resolutions and just yesterday I just signed on Mayors United against anti-Semitism and I just signed on to that and I know hundreds of other mayors across this country are working in that vein. Um, you know, uh, we're we're at a very crucial point in in our in our society, and where violence and um, you know hateful speech, hateful actions, um, have taken on a whole new level. And you know, and and I will tell you that um, just trying to monitor some of the behavior and and I think uh, the emboldenedness of uh, social media uh, to allow people to continue. Um, in a vein that is 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 so counterproductive for any civilized society, and and I you know I, I feel as a leader of this community, uh, and, and and I'm happy to see uh, my rep uh, Jack Lewis is on this call too, and I know Jack has spoken up and out um, uh, about you know. Um, hatred in, that, that is targeted at him, sometimes, you know, tar targeted at me. I mean, you know, uh, so, you know, we deal with it personally on a very personal level, but also as leaders too, we stand for something. And I'm a staunch believer if you um, are going to lead a community and it's important that to, to make everyone feel that they're an integral part of that community, then you need to stand up, speak out, and also empower our children, our students in school, uh, as well as their families too, because oftentimes I, I will hear people, you know, they'll hear something or see something and they'll feel helpless because they don't know what to do. And I think, um, you know, some of that effort uh, here in Framingham is that, uh, you know, I just hired our very first uh, uh, diver uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion officer uh, that I am very, very optimistic that can help not only um, at the municipal level, but also uh, in our community holistically and, uh, you know, with the help of some of our other partners in this work. And I see Joe Corzini is also on this call and he is um, uh, assistant superintendent in schools. So, you know, there is a partnership here in Framingham and I think that is becoming much more uh, solid um, but we have to learn to have the skills to interrupt behavior and, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that folks know that this is unacceptable and continue that effort. And it, it really does it require not only those that are at the, um, the targets of some of this behavior, um, but it's louder when those that are not a part of that group or not part of that target group um, to speak up and speak out. And I think that is something that we have to get a lot better at. It doesn't matter to have the conversation outside the meeting or send the text message and say, oh, I'm sorry that happened. You need to say it in the meeting, in the just in time while it's happening and be bold about it. So, yeah. you know, I just... Sorry, Robin. I just, no. you know, because this is a near and dear subject to my heart. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I want to make two. I want to just listening to you speak. I want to make two other quick points. Uh, one is it's we're up against a real challenge. And I'm just thinking back for a second to the Belmont tragedy, because I know D.A. Ryan was very clear in her comments about community impact and that we're talking about a racial incident. Uh, Chief McIsaac. I mean, uh, civil rights was charged right away. This was not like, okay, we're gonna, you know, we'll look at, this was, we need an investigation, but it, the, the message to the community is like, oh, that's a good point, we'll look into it. Like it was, it was up front. Yet, if you looked at most of the media headlines, it was about a road rage case. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just say that because like, I think it's, I, I don't wanna make too many judgment, but I was personally kind of like, this isn't a road, this is not a road rage here. This was a, uh, you know, and I'm not speaking for the DA, obviously, but this was, a, this was a racial murder. And the people that I was speaking to or that were texting me were like, this is a racial murder. Like what's go, you know, this is, this is serious. And so I think that that's one of the sort of almost like media things that we're constantly up against. 
-hmm. And then the other thing, just when you were speaking about the social media, and I know we have a number of, uh, we have some state representatives here. Doxing is a huge problem, which is when these websites put personal information about people on their sites. And, you know, uh, District Attorney Rollins was a victim of this because Turtle Boys, which, you know, I, I don't know the specifics of what happened on Christmas Eve, but what I do know is Turtle Boys website, which is based in Worcester, Massachusetts, went and put her information on their website. And that led to people going to her home. And that's a real problem. And I can give you several other examples of this particular group, uh, Turtle Boys, uh, targeting other people. In, uh, there was one a family in Ashland uh, where personal information, photographs of children and addresses were put on the website. So I think there's probably some legislative uh, solution there that maybe that balances First Amendment. But these forces are at work within our own, um, within our own communities. Mm -hmm. And so we need, to, we need to be very, very vigilant. Who else wants to, uh... Mayor Fuller, you've been pretty transparent in your, um, when this has popped up in Newton, I know particularly, uh, you know, in recent years when something happens in the schools, it's a school community, um, it's a school community issue. And I, I don't, maybe you could talk about yeah. like how the kind of feedback you get from, I'll, you know, taking that approach. I'll just back up what you're seeing in the statistics we're seeing play out um, in, in real time right here in Newton. Let me give you three examples that all happened within uh, the last few weeks. Uh, a couple of days ago, um, a black, this is elementary or middle. This must have been, uh, it was an elementary school teacher had an ALM physical flyer put in his school mailbox. Uh, we had um, in the last few weeks, first one and then a second banner put up on an overpass that was a combination of white supremacy and anti-Semitic slogans and images and words. Uh, we took the first one down, reported it, second one is up. Uh, the second one went up about a week later. And then the third incident, we happened to have a special election for um, uh, um, an open city council seat. Um, could you say the word is doxing, Robert? I'm doxing, yeah. Doxing. Um, one of the candidates who is, I would say, a progressive liberal uh, was doxed. Her, she, um, her home address was given out and uh, people were encouraged to show up. It got intermixed with defund the Newton Police Department and uh, she happens to be white, but was, it gets all mixed up with race and policing and hate. And um, so th those all happened within two weeks. Um, so yes, we're very transparent about it, um, but it, it's just shocking how frequent it is. So, and also like it's intimidation. I mean, that's what some of this is. I mean, I... I felt really for this, this Ashland family, which uh, they drove, I mean, this is going back to the fall. They drove by a Trump rally. I think it was in Hopkins. I don't remember what town, I think they were from Ashland. And they took, I can't speak to why they did this, but they, they screamed some things out the window while they drove by. It was a nine-year-old child who was uh, gesturing with his finger outside at this group of, they took pictures, the Trump supporters, uh, it was a Trump rally. They took a ton of pictures, including the license plate of the car. They sent it all to Turtle Boys. They published where the parents work. The, they're actually school teachers. They published the addresses of the car where the car was registered. And then it was everything that was put on this website was then put on a Stormfront, which is a neo-Nazi website, national one. 
So suddenly, like the employers of these parents are getting bombarded by neo-Nazis from across the country, by the way. And then you've got like a whole personal safety issue. So it's, um, you know, and it's all intimidation. And, you know, if you go to someone's house and, you know, at two in the morning and you, you take their BLM sign, like that's a form of intimidation. And the signs that you're referring to, it's actually a, it's actually a South African kind of neo-Nazi group that, that, that put up those signs. They've got a few people here. Um, you know, that is part of a trend we've seen in the last four to five years of more and more and more and more of this content in the public space. And I, I think we should not underestimate the impact that that can have on people and the way it can actually get people to act out in other ways. And so it's, it's important to not just take it down, but to call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. Robert, this is uh, Representative Wynn. So thank you very much um, for this conversation. And as you're talking, I was thinking through, you know, your uh, what you were saying about intimidation. And I, I was an attorney doing a lot of civil work. So admittedly, I don't do a lot of criminal work, but I wanted to hear more about um, where we're at in our state in terms of penalty schemes for threats and harassment. Um, that are intimidation over time. I mean, we're talking about hate crimes, like the hate crimes that make it into the papers are like really heinous crimes, but there are these more insidious types of intimidation and threats and they happen over time and they're, they don't really rise to that level that um, where they would make the, the papers, but nevertheless it causes threats, intimidation with the intent to um, you know, make a, uh, to threaten a particular person, uh, whether it's uh, with violence or a uh, serious injury. So how, what legislative fix do you think exists out there that we could think about to address those very, um, I don't want to say small, but they're just, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're not as big as the ones that we're talking about now. So there was, um, and, you know, I should have come prepared with the name of the representative, your colleague who actually had this bill that was filed in the last session. But I think it's a careful balance between First Amendment and actually doing things that, uh, you know, cross the line to incitement and like encourage people to target others. And, you know, that's where I think there is room. I mean, we've got all, you know, we have all these state harassment laws. But the question is, if I go and now, you know, you know, do some searches and find out where you live, who your children are, who your spouse or partner is, where you work, and start putting all of this stuff out there with language that, you know, encourages people to come after you. I think there's an argument to be made that that may be that's starting to that's starting to go over the line. You know, some of these sites are really good at, you know, Turtle Boys is really good. Like, if, you know, I'm, they could go find my public, you know, where I live, probably very easily and just put it on a website and then I have to go like are they actually encouraging people or are people just sort of taking cues so I think it's a fine line uh, Washington State uh, passed a really good law just uh, actually the in August uh, the governor in Washington State passed a law to deal with it because they have a lot of there's a lot of extremists uh, in the Pacific Northwest and this was something that they did to try and control it so I'm happy to follow up with you um, offline after the call. Um, and maybe we can- Yes, that would be great. I'm actually considering a bill um, to strengthen our, um, our current statute now too, because I think that case law places too much of a burden um, on the victim um, to essentially establish that they're a membership in a protected class. And so I'm, I've been thinking about hate crimes and just all the instances that have happened um, this past year, especially, you know, uh, violence against the um, Asian American Pacific Islander community after, you know, coronavirus and you have people calling it the Kung flu and other um, just really problematic terminology. And so would love to follow up with you. Yeah, on that. We, we actually did a study. We just ADL did a whole analysis looking at the, you know, the impact. Uh, I'll just say we're a 501c3, so we don't 
support uh, particular political candidates. But we did a study looking at the impact of President Trump's, former President Trump's tweets when he would use that kind of really derogatory, bigoted language. And there was always a spike in incidents against people, Asian Americans, AAPI, after one of those tweets went out. And so there, there is like real solid emerging data that is now come, you know, that's, you know, that's now being analyzed and researched of the impact when somebody puts something out on social media, people go and do things. And I think, you know, the, the flyers, the graffiti, all of this other stuff, that's, that, that, that's part of this. It's not just confined to, you know, a tweet from one person. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll um, connect with you to get that report. Okay. <clears throat> Um, can I just make a quick comment, Marianne? Um, is I don't want to minimize. We shouldn't minimize one of the statements you talk about uh, not only transparency but the effect of social media. I think it's it's really um, inhibiting those who want to be able to speak out and those who want to have um, um, these these tough conversations. Um, and I think it's becoming a real problem. We've seen it. I have an example here in, in, in Natick where they have a task force, an equity task force that they put together to start having these tough conversations in the community, but several members are afraid to talk in public. They don't wanna have a public meeting. They don't wanna have, but they are a, a, a task force that is appointed by the select board. So they have to have public meetings and um, they have fear. So they have fear. But the problem that we have going through this is that now they come to the police department, they come to me and the chief and say, how are you going to protect us if we have these conversations and we get reaction um, as we've seen through social media? And that's a tough question to answer, um, especially from a law enforcement perspective, as you say, because I can't be realistic with them and say, I'm gonna be able to protect you from anyone who has a, a differing opinion. Um, and I can't, you know, you know, 12 members of, 11 members of the task force, I can't assign someone to protect their house. That's not realistic. So when they hear that type of response, especially from their police department, you now they get really concerned. And I think it inhibits that conversation and that discussion. So this issue around the tax that come around social media, I think is really creating this problem where we aren't having that transparent conversation. It's not happening. We have a, a, we have a hotline that I monitor and people call it a hotline and literally says, just like you say, someone took my Black Lives Matter um, signs. Somebody took my rainbow sign. Someone took, wrote graffiti on my fence, but I don't want anything to do, be done about it. I just wanted to be reported. And that gets a little bit frustrating, but we see where that's coming from. And, and that's the problem. And, and I don't have an answer to that. And, and, and going forward, um, it's gonna take some strong voices to overcome that. Go, go ahead. <clears throat> go ahead, DA Ron. No, I was gonna say, Chief, you're right. I mean, and that was a piece of us forming this task force is because we continue to see things that are impacting the community. They may not rise to the level of a crime or people may not wanna have conversations about that or get themselves targeted, but we can't have them. And part of the goal of this was to begin those conversations. And I don't know whether um, Kim Haley Jackson's with us from the um, Belmont Human Rights Commission and that exact issue came up in Belmont. I mean, fortunately we were able to get Robert was willing to help us and come moderate a town meeting, but it was clear after the events of a week ago that we needed to have conversation in town. And it is not right to put that on people who may be volunteering to help in town. You take the responsibility, you lead the charge. I mean, that's one of the reasons why in Belmont, and I was fortunate to have the, the support of Chief McIsaac in this, Early on, we called this out as a racial incident. So that was done. And then we were able to bring the town together with 
you know, Robert coming from outside to be able to talk about that because it's, you know, it's not, it's not the job or it should not be the job of people who are trying to help advance their community to take this on at their own peril. So Kim, I don't know if you want, I saw you nodding when Robert was speaking. I don't know if you want to talk to this. I do. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, so a couple of things I, I'd like to bring to the attention of everyone on the call today. So as a member of the Human Rights Commission and Chief Hicks, you hit, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, you know, we are a public commission. So we're open to, um, you know, open public meeting laws. And we put out a statement about the attack on the Capitol January 6th. Um, our agendas are posted online for the public to see every month. No one comes to those meetings except for our liaisons. We have a very close relationship with Chief McIsaac. Um, we have a close relationship with the schools. Every month it comes up, right? When we posted, we were holding a special session to vote on our statement for the insurrection on the Capitol. It got leaked to the public. People were told to attend the call who were in direct opposition to our statement. And the entire group felt intimidated. So it kind of put a spin on how we run our meetings now. So we kind of button down a little bit, allow only a certain amount of time for comments. But I had people who have served on the commission that were thinking about resigning due to how we were attacked by members of the public. So as we're coming into a, you know, a sort of a different world where we are trying to become more visible and more active in the community, I think that's going to be an issue going forward. So we're trying to navigate this new world that we're in. Not only that was started, you know, with everything in Belmont kind of changed, I would say about five years ago. Um, we started to see more incidents of racial bullying uh, with the rise of Trump. Um, the town tended to have kind of a blind eye about racism. They have like a one track mind about racism and generally it is linked to the MECO students. So those people who are of color in Belmont are virtually invisible. They're saying it's not their problem. I'm telling them consistently, it's your problem. Mm. It's all been brought to a head with the murder of Henry Tapia. When the vigil that was quickly put together by cause and full disclosure, I work with both, right? So I'm vice chair of the Human Rights Commission, but I'm also on the steering committee of cause. We, <laughs> cause put that vigil together very quickly with the support of the family. A lot of the feedback that we received was, why are you bringing race into it? This isn't Belmont's problem. These people didn't even live here. They were of the community, is my understanding. It does not matter if they were multi-general Belmontians or not. It affected a family that lived in Belmont. It happened on a Belmont street. Therefore, it is your problem. Mm -hmm. But we don't get that sort of support from the general public. I think, you know, we have a great working relationship, again, with the, with the police department. We're looking at having a diversity task force. Um, with the town, we're looking at trying to hire a, a diversity and inclusion director for the school district. But it's, you know, I'm feeling a little bit of, a, of resistance um, from the town. And I think that it's plain from the community forum that we had last week. And thank you so much, Robert, for moderating that. Um, we still have a lot of work to do and people are still blind to it. So you know, we're struggling here in this little town that looks at itself as quiet and we don't have these kind of problems. So, you know, any sort of assistance that we can get with navigating this would be extremely helpful. I, I think we're running into what had been the norm of, you know, let's all go to a MLK breakfast on, on you know, Jan January once a year, we'll sit there and everything is very nice. It's very polite but no one wants to hear the real truth. We have to have difficult conversations in order to heal and come together. And so I, I think that's where we're having a problem because I'm not a person to mince words.
um, racism and discrimination is ugly. And, you know, I don't, my hope is that the town can get past this, but they have to listen to some ugly truths first. I mean, I think that kind of started last week because as more and more people spoke, people were telling stories and those story, you know, people were reflecting and you did this as well. People were reflecting on their experience with racism and it wasn't in the last, you know, six months or like two weeks ago. It was over a period, uh, I think of decades. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the other, the other, um, it doesn't really address this issue of like the public facing um, harassment that people face for being, you know, the involved in this is, you know, having some very figuring out a way to have a more private public space for a group of people to have a real conversation. Um, that is not, you know, it's not the, you know, it, it's not at a human rights commission meeting where everybody has been appointed and you've got, you know, you've got to be um, transparent or even like a task force appointed by a city council, a board of selectmen, but figuring out a way, like how do we pick 15 leaders in a community? Um, and I would, I would, I would push a little bit and say that probably includes like maybe someone from the police department uh, to like, make a commitment to like, you know, once a month, we're gonna have a private, you know, closed door ground rules discussion about some of these things. And I know that they're happening in workplaces. Um, I, I'm actually a part of a group that's been meeting for months uh, in Boston. It's been, it's been very, uh, it's been really important. It's been a very important thing for me personally and professionally, but I wonder if there's a way to do that at the town level. Um, that's kind of out of the public spotlight because then you're actually building up leaders and you're building up the kind of um, resilience that's really needed in, in, the, in the face of the pushback that comes with this kind of change and recognition. So I, I think in Belmont, there's a way to, I won't say circumnavigate, I think cause is quickly becoming sort of like the action arm in town. Um, they are not a town blessed meeting. It's just a group of community volunteers that work together outside of the umbrella of the town commissions. So I think that there's a real opportunity for change. There's a lot of outreach that's being done. We have a forum tonight for black and brown parents in Belmont, we're looking to expand that out to just black and brown citizens within the town. Um, but we're not held to any sort of open meeting laws. We don't have those same kind of constraints. And so I think it's important that those sort of community grassroots, um, those people are, are brought to the table. Like in a forum like this, this would be very beneficial uh, to have more of our staring members um, on a call like this. And Robert, I think you're right. I mean, and Alia can speak a little bit to this. Since last spring, we have been having those conversations within our office, with our entire staff. Um, they have been hard conversations. It has, people have had to grow into having those conversations, but I think it has done that. It has encouraged people to become leaders in this area. And I don't know, Aya, if you wanna speak a little bit. Sure, um, so uh, some of the, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alia Khalidi. I am the director of training at the Middlesex DA's office. I'm also chair of our affinity group. And I think one of the things that we did as an office, um, so DA Ryan and I lead discussions on systemic racism for, uh, every staff member in our office. They are mandatory um, because we believe everyone needs to be a part of these conversations. A lot of times these conversations, I think, happen in the dark corners of a, of a courtroom when you know a, a person of color um, is, um, 
you know, has just experienced a microaggression or, or something or some incident of bias. So one of the things we wanted to do was bring some of the conversations into the um, into the main fold. And, and um, a lot of things that we were doing, um, I think sometimes fill gaps in um, in people's education or memory about um, race uh, incidents or racial history. Um, so uh, one of the things that we started out doing was uh, talking about uh, white privilege because we couldn't even get to Black Lives Matter until we talked about white privilege and 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 how what a white person faces and what a person of color faces might be two different things. Um, and then we talk about Black Lives Matter. We read um, chapters from the new Jim Crow. We watch uh, the movie 13th. Um, and we're doing this for every member of our office um, and holding these um, discussion groups via Zoom. And I think one of the responses we've been getting in the office is um, for a lot of our more experienced ADAs, I think this is the first time that um, they uh, have had conversations like this. Um, and for our less experienced ADAs, um, they're kind of like, okay, we know this, <laughs> what are we going to do next? So I think one of the things that we've had a chance to do is really foster discussion and people bring forward very um, personal stories, um, but we set the ground rules ahead of time and we talk about how, you know, we'll take the lessons away from um, what we're doing as opposed to, um, you know, we will we'll listen to the stories, but we'll take the lessons and try to apply them in our day to day work. And, and I think it's really made an impact on how people approach these issues and their comfort level in, in talking about privilege and race. Chief McIsaac, um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about you've been very involved in a lot of these efforts going on all year in town, even before you were the chief, but just sort of in the last week or so, the response to the murder and sort of where you've seen that go and things that you want to build on or think we could be doing better. Yeah, there's uh, Chief uh, James McIsaac, Belmont Police. Um, there's a lot going on. You know, I'm just, I, I was writing notes just what Robert was talking about. Um, you know, I just a couple of things um, when Robert mentioned that this is just a, um, you know, people calling this just a road rage incident. Uh, the victim's brother had said, uh, he, he was being interviewed by WPUR, I was standing next to him and he said, I don't understand, he said, where the outpouring is. He said, if a police officer had killed my brother, he said, there would be, it would, there would be tons of, you know, response. But he said, a white man killed him. And, you know, he said, it's just sort of a road rage incident. And uh, so he was referring to that, but we, we also, I think what what's, what we're seeing in Belmont right now is I've made an effort to be every place all the time. Uh, uh, COS with, with uh, Kimberly Haley Jackson and, and Sarah Billadu. I've, I'm participating in their speaker series. And I think what we saw at, at the last meeting, um, the last, last Wednesday's meeting with Robert, is I think uh, that the town may have not expected um, you know, I think they thought it was going to be a meeting that was going to focus primarily on the police again. And I think we've been respectfully challenged for a number of years as a police department uh, here in Belmont by, by various different groups, Belmont Against Racism. We respond, we participate. Now I think you're starting to see um, a little bit more of that challenge occur occurring, not just in the police department, but whether it's the select board, uh, the, the human, the um, HR departments and things like that. And, um, you know, I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a drawing one time that uh, a, a cartoon that had a glacier sliding down a mountain and at the tip of the glacier, it said police and across the, the body of the glacier, it said systemic racism. You know, we're kind of like, I think in a community, police departments can be sort of that low hanging fruit you know, every time we talk about diversifying our workforce in Belmont, they always talk about the police department or the schools. And, um, you know, I, I think there's there's other areas that, and, and I've talked about this before. I said, if, you know, we'll work on uh, 
eliminating uh, racism within, within the police department and within the ways we interact with, um, with our residents and our visitors to our community. But you know, police officers come from the fabric that is America and every other institution, uh, employer, they all have to work on this as well. Um, and I think, uh, Kim can tell you, I think we, we you know, they, there was a meeting last night that was, uh, I think, again, the, the, the town was challenged, the town wide uh, town was challenged to, uh, to meet, these, meet these challenges. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I think eventually the outcome is gonna be good. And because uh, it certainly helped the police department. You know, we're not the police department. We were 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and we get better and better the more I meet and engage in, in, in discussions and groups. The more I learn, the more I pass that information on to, to our offices, and uh, the better we become. So I, I hope uh, that, you know, I think last night the town of Belmont, um, the select board voted to create a commission, a task force, to look at bringing in a diversity uh, officer for the town which I wholeheartedly support. I would love to have a person that I could go to when we create a policy or something and have somebody look through a different lens and say, you know, hey, this, this solicit a bylaw that we're gonna enforce this way. How do you see this? You know, how do you see that this is gonna be perceived if you're a person of color and two police cars drive up because you're, you're selling magazines to, you know, door to door or things like that. I, I would, you know, it would be a great benefit in, in a community like Belmont to have that. Uh, available to us. Right. So I, I kind of want to speak to the, the meeting last night. Um, yes, you know, they agreed to a diversity task force, or at least to, to vote on it. Looks like, you know, it's going to happen. Here's my problem. So it's very reactionary, right? So instead of thinking about these things in real time, you know, Again, we have another black man murdered before a town takes action. I've lived in Belmont for 10 years, so I'm not a lifelong resident. I'm originally from Missouri, not too far from Ferguson. So it's like, um, you know, we, Belmont's demographics in the 10 years that I've been here have consistently changed. While we don't have a large black population, I think the last census we were at 1.8% black. However, 10 years ago, it was 14.9% Asian. Um, and that number is growing. But where are these people in terms of leadership at the town level? And even when we had the meeting last night, there was, you know, we were relegated to the end of the, the meeting. We were kind of rushed through. Two out of the three of the selectmen were very supportive. But I can tell you walking away from that, I didn't feel comfortable in moving forward. You know, there are a lot of things going on in town that need to be called attention to. You know, unfortunately the, the death of Henry Tapia kind of brings all this up. There was also a 15 year old girl who went missing. Naya Brown was a 15 year old black girl who went missing in town and we know the Belmont police were looking for her. I know that because I work very closely with Jamie, but the response from the school, virtually silent. Mm. I have noted and you know, down another road, but this is kind of calling to attention all of the issues that are happening in town. The failure to recognize Henry Tapia as a member of the Belmont community all the hard work that was put in to bring people together to honor his memory. But at the same time, we had a 15 year old child who was missing. Nothing was said to the community from the school. There were no search groups for her. As far as I know, I actually had a meeting with the principal and the su assistant superintendent and I brought it up and they were right that they dropped the ball on it. But my question to them was, how comfortable do you think children of color feel at that school? knowing that there was no concerted effort by the school to check on how the children of color felt. How did these children feel about the death of this man who had a children in town? It just, it was heartbreaking that there was a family who had a child missing and this community did not pull together to support that father who was looking for his child. 
when I have no doubt in my mind, I've seen this community pull together through, tra through tragedies. We've lost a, a, a young woman as a junior in high school to illness. The response from the community was overwhelming in the school. But this 15 year old black girl goes missing. She's lived here maybe for a year and the, and the town did nothing. And that is what we're working on. So I would ask everyone on the call, like, please, like, you know, give us some direction. Jamie can only do so much. The Belmont Human Rights Commission can only do so much. DA Ryan, thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, our community groups, cause can only do so much. They need a seat at the table, but you know, any sort of assistance that you guys can give us and how we can move forward because, you know, we're all volunteers working here. My message to the town was, it is up to you to make sure that your citizens feel protected. It's not my job as a volunteer. I do this because I love it, but it is your job as a select board to make sure that everyone feels included in this town and we do not. Robert, I know there's some folks with hands up. Do you wanna call on people? I know, um, I, I, I don't wanna mispronounce her name, Charu. Charu, yeah. Charu, I'm sorry. I know you had your hand up for a while and then um, State Rep Gouvea, I, I, I Gouveia. apologize because Gouveia, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you actually did a great job with my name, thank you. Um, my name's Charu Verma and I work during the day as a public defender for the Committee for Public Counsel Services. I'm also the co-chair of the Massachusetts Bar Association's Criminal Justice Section Council. And um, the question that I had for actually uh, Robert and the other law enforcement agents on the call, and thank you for joining us, is I think um, Kim sort of touched on a connection. You mentioned earlier that um, hate crimes are one of the most underreported crimes. And I was wondering if you could talk about the connection between perceptions about racism that is inherent within the police force. I think I've read a lot of very interesting and telling articles that after what happened on January 6th at the Capitol, that there is a connection between military and police and ex-police. And I think part of why some of these crimes are so underreported is that there is a perception that there is systemic racism inherent within policing. And that also makes people wary or not willing to engage with law enforcement because they are not seen as protectors or peace officers. And so I was wondering if you would, would and also for the mayors, because I think this is something you also have to deal with, these cultural changes that we're talking about are 10 to 15 years in the making, if you're really talking about changing a culture. So what would be some short-term strategies that we might be able to engage in to either shift that perception or root out some of the quote unquote bad apples so that it stops spoiling that uh, in, or engage in that work and engagement. Because I do think that there's a connect, now that we're being more transparent and we can have these discussions, what can, how can that shift occur as well? I mean, I can say, first of all, it's great to get a question from a a PD because I used to be I, I used to be a PD too so uh, it was one of my favorite jobs actually um, I can't I mean there you know Chief McIsaac may be I'm sure and uh, maybe Chief Hicks could also add I mean statistically there's like 800,000 you know police officers in the United States and there are you know we have seen this sort of connection to a small number uh, connected to extremism as well as uh, people in the military. And I, you know, I get, you know, part of it, at least for me is, uh, you know, leadership is absolutely critical. You know, even thinking back to the Belmont meeting, I think a lot of the people in the town were actually looking to Chief McIsaac as an ally. That was sort of, uh, it was not a, that was not a beat up on the police kind of meeting. I'm just being kind of blunt, having been to many of those myself. Um, so I think leadership is just absolutely critical because that sort of sets the tone and the culture. And I agree, it's, this is like a multi-year kind of, of initiative. You know, there was an incident, 
on the North Shore in Essex County that came to light recently where two police officers got into an argument. It was in the, I don't know if it was Swampscott or Marsh, uh, I guess it was in, I think it was in Swampscott. They got into an argument in the, par in, in the parking lot. Some of you may know this. It happened like 18 months ago. And like one officer picked up a can on the street on the, in the parking lot and he carved a swastika into the other officer's personal vehicle. And um, it was Chief Piccarello, like they, they terminated, the, the guy resigned. He was, he was, the officer was, was out. And they're sort of embarking now on their own sort of cultural, like how did this, how did this happen 18 months ago and no one knew about it or, or what, but that was like, I think an important statement from the top, like not going to be tolerated. And I do think it's also a question of like, what was it that in this particular interaction the go-to way to express my disagreement with another person was the swastika. And like, that's also like what happens when two people get into an argument and the go-to is racial epithets. Like what, what's going on inside that brings that out. Um, but I, I think this is actually a, a top priority and it's one that, you know, you can't do one training and flick the switch and like, okay, we're good. Everything's done. We're all great now. It's not going to work that way. It's, it's going it, to, there has to be an investment over, over a period of time. Robert, if I might follow up on that, I, I think you just stole my thunder, but you said it so, so well, is that it's an investment. I think that what's really important to the community is, is that you have those partnerships with your community so that when there is an incident, you're not sharing information that the dialogue and the foundation is already set. So I think the investment begins years and years prior by shedding a light on your department, showing the community what type of training, what type of values. Um, we are a value driven police department and it's through the leadership of, of our select board and our community that demand that from us. So I think if you have a community that demands excellence and demands accountability with their police department and you make an investment, um, when there is an incident, um, I think everyone's on the same page and you're able to put names to faces and realize um, the values of the officers involved in, in, in the services that we provide. Just as an example, uh, we would do a community stakeholder series that Margot, uh, who's on the board, was very involved in, where we would bring members of the community, elected and appointed officials with police officers and community stakeholders for trainings. Um, what type of training do police receive? And we exposed those trainings to the community to show. And there was this great cross-section of questions and interaction. And I think Robert really hit it right, the nail right on the head, that it's an investment. It's not a one-time investment. It's a continual investment. And I think if you subscribe to that theory, um, I think transparency, accountability, and your values will, will come through. Could I, could I jump in real quick? Um, Joe Corazzini, I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Equity, Diversity, and Community Development for the Framingham Public Schools. One of the things that I wanted to add to the conversation is sort of a as historical context, which I think is important. I always talk about this with my staff in the context of education and recognizing that I'm part of an institution that has historically oppressed people of color and immigrants and uh, queer brothers and sisters, you know, queer folks. And like, I got to own that. Um, and part of what I talk about when training my staff is the idea that sometimes it's not about us as individuals, right? It's about us as institutional leaders and recognizing that historically the ways in which our institutions have perpetuated oppression or marginalized um, some folks. And so part of the work that we have to do in terms of creating in some of that restoration is in that healing is to affirm the existence um, and the, the lived experiences of people. Unfortunately for officers, whether fairly or unfairly, they are the face of the crimin of criminal justice. The failures of it, the successes of it, they're the face of it. And there has been historically not a lot of great things happening in communities of color um, in terms of criminal justice, right? We don't have to we don't have to go deep into that. I think people can agree with that, right? Hopefully. So, you know, from from a community, from a person of color's lens, a community, what people are looking for, they're looking for the affirmation. And they're looking for um, that through action for people to showcase that they have a more nuanced understanding of racism, its impact on, on particularly communities of color, and a willingness to try and re-engage and to rethink the ways in which we uh, we look at how we police our communities. You know, 
it's the it's the idea that an officer can say, yeah, Black Lives Matter, right? And can understand the, you know, sort of why the communities of color might be resistant to sort of the idea of sort of this blue lives, right? I'm not resistant to the idea that supporting officers, I love individuals, I love officers, I want them to be healthy and successful. I do have concerns when there's a, a rising movement that is directly in contrast to the to a movement that was created to bring up the you know the concerns around oppression and oppression that people of color face in existence to um, you know in the criminal justice system and being able to like live in that space and have those conversations and know that people are coming from a good place right like like if I can have my cousin who's a black woman and a detective in Tuscaloosa Alabama stand up and have community forums and talk about Black Lives Matter put up a sign as an officer. Then I'd imagine like in the state of Massachusetts, we could also do that, right? We could also have these more contextual conversations where we engage rather and pull people in rather than push people out. And I think in that space, what you're doing is you're creating actual, like you're, you're, we're taking some leaps of faith, but we're also making statements with our actions about what we actually stand for. Because I think part of what's happening is that people are waiting for leaders in the community to say like things are wrong when they're when there's national attention. I get a lot of pushback all the time because we have been making statements um, a lot in the last few years since I've been here about some of the national things like um, the bombing of like the, or the attacks on the synagogues and the, you know, the churches and all that. We because it, it and we I lean in our core beliefs in our mission statement as a district. If we're educating the young minds to become better citizens, then we have to process past history as well as living history. And so our job is not to pass on our own political views, more so to engage students in like the practice of modeling, you know, difficult conversations, respectfully, morally, and asking sort of the ethical question of like, why do people think this? Or why do they believe this? Because in that process, that critical analysis, uh, you know, with the deep, that deep learning is what we're trying to get through. And in there, if we're not modeling that for our kids, then who's modeling it for them? And so I'd say the same thing to you all as institutional leaders, how are you modeling those practices in your community for you? Um, because you're going to, I'm, I know, you know, I talked to our chief, Chief Baker, who's awesome. And I've sat there and watched him talk with, you know, some of our high school students about, yeah, like I've, I've got, you've probably read about some of the bad officers I've had and I've had to sort of fire them, right? But, you know, but their actions are not indicative of all the other good officers who are trying to do good stuff. So I think there's a place for the conversation, but there's also has to be a, a sort of historical context and lens in terms of how we approach it. Because if not, then it can feel like, well, I believe this, you believe that, and we stay on our sort of opposite ends. Thank, thank you, Joe, for framing that. Um, State Rep. Gubia, I know you you wanted to speak, so. Yes, hi, everybody. I'm really uh, honored to be here with all of you. Sorry, I was a little late. Was there a specific question that we're responding to or are we just sharing? Okay, um, so the things that I, uh, are resonating with me in this conversation since I joined. Um, you know, Kim, the comments you made about your experience in Belmont, I represent uh, the town of Acton. It's where I'm sitting right now. Um, we've had a lot of really tense discussions around race and racism and systemic racism. Our school committee uh, a number of months ago voted to retire the Colonial's mascot based on concerns that students brought forth that uh, it doesn't represent them, that it feels racist, that um, it's steeped in, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the atrocities to our indigenous populations uh, in this area. And it caused, it's been causing continuous conversations where people of color have been saying over and over again, racism is here, racism is here, racism is here. I experience it. I've had numerous conversations with white parents and they said, well, racism isn't here. And I said, how do you know? You're not a mom of color. How do you know this? And then it's it's caused a stir in a, in a positive way. Um, and then of course the murder of uh, you know George Floyd uh, by, by Derek Chauvin and just all of the incidences have continued to sort of build. But then we had this mascot vote that happened in our town. And um, we had a number of incidences where uh, someone from outside the community apparently has come in and weaponized Zoom and made incredibly racist uh, comments to the two women of color, the only two black women on our school committee made comments about their appearance, made comments about their gender. So I think what's also important is that we oftentimes see this layering. If you're a woman of color in a leadership position, you're attacked even more so than if you're a man of color or you know a white woman. And it's, and it's caused this, I think, really important conversation, but also um, exposure of a lot of bad leadership and bad actors who have 
continue to contribute to the pain and the trauma that our communities of color are already experiencing. And so I guess what I'm sort of, I, I first just wanted to say that, you know, Belmont is similar in sort of demographics to Acton. Um, you know, I, I see this conversation happening in multiple places where people of color are saying racism is real and then white people in town are just not seeing it or not experiencing it. So to them, it's turning a blind eye. Um, I also wanna sort of call out a little bit around, you know, it's great that we had the police reform bill. Um, I was more than happy to support and, and passage of that bill. But what I kept saying over and over again last year, and I think we're seeing this come to a head a little bit in this conversation is that police reform is only one part of the problem to the points that um, Chief McIsaac, I think you said this, or maybe it was you Chief Hicks about the, the glacier and underneath is systemic racism. Well, police don't show up to ask a brown person what they're doing in cleaning trash that they saw floating around because a white person called and said, somebody is suspicious and I think they're taking packages. It was a landscaper who saw that trash was blowing around and just went and picked it up. And this happens every single day in our communities. And these are the things that white people in our communities need to just start to understand and own more that we are part of the problem. If we're picking up the phone and weaponizing, you know, someone doing a, a, a service to somebody else, a complete stranger and picking up their trash that was floating around and a police officer is getting called, that puts our officers in a dangerous place too um, because they're, they're, they're constantly showing up and because the public is asking them to. And it's not, it's not helpful. And so it goes back to me, this sense of like who belongs and who doesn't belong. And I was in one of my communities campaigning. I'm a white woman. Police got called on me when I was campaigning because I have a really old Toyota Camry and I don't think it looked like I didn't belong in that community. And I walked away feeling like, man, you know, this, I'm so lucky I'm a white woman. I, I know that if I were a person of color, just what the experience could have been so completely different. So I do think it's important that, you know, uh, white people, I, I, you know, sometimes can scapegoat law enforcement as being the source of the problem when it's so much deeper than that. And, you know, I appreciate these conversations. Uh, I'm frustrated by them um, in a lot of ways because they're not happening fast enough. Our young people are saying, you got to get this together, adults, you got to get moving on this. We need justice now. We need true equity, equity and true belonging because we're continuously traumatizing people who are our neighbors, um, our loved ones, our friends. And I just um, I just wanted to reflect back to that and just, you know, I don't know what the answers are, Kim, to what's going on in Belmont, but just know that, um, you know, there are some of us in other communities that are having the same exact conversations. Um, and I hope that they go in a place that's, um, you know, really productive in the end. Um, but I also, you know, Margaret, Margaret, I see you here and I'm wondering what training exists for select board members to lead around these issues? Because, I mean, you know, that's our leadership structure in so many communities. And I see this over and over again, where there's some like tension um, between community members and leadership. Oftentimes leadership lags in being truly representative of the diversity of our communities. We see this at the state house. We see this at the local level. So maybe we need some, I don't know. I don't think training solves all the problems. I really don't, but you know, is there, is there an opportunity for there to be some uh, leadership growth in that area? Not to put you on the spot, Margot. Well, that's okay, uh, Reverend Gouvea. My hand was up anyway. And I, I feel like I don't wanna take up all the rest of the time because I know Marie also has her hand up. Um, but I wanted to tie together a couple of things and I appreciate that invitation to speak from the perspective of the town leadership because to Kim's point and her experience, um, I can affirm that there's a lot of pressure and it's quiet pressure not to burst the bubble on the nice community uh, you know, reputation of a place like Belmont or like Bedford. And I know Robert started this conversation with mentioning that Bedford had had a series of anti-Semitic incidents and they laughed, they, there were several over the course of three, two, two years from about 2013 to 2015. And um, we were profiled in the Boston Globe. Uh, Linda K. Wertheimer did a wonderful uh, profile of what we did. And it really, uh, it was a good lesson in how transparency 
and facing up to things can strengthen a community. And it doesn't, uh, you, you, you may burst people's bubble a little bit, but what comes afterwards is better. And I'm not saying that we got it all right. And I'm not saying that Bedford is perfect, but it's, you know, but we did that. Um, and part of it was having those community roundtables that Chief Bongiorno was at, that I participated in. Um, and uh, Chief Hicks is our prior uh, uh, chief from before Chief Bongiorno joined us. So I feel like I have the history of Bedford sitting at the, at the, in, this, uh, in this conversation, but we had to um, give people space to reveal to us the reality that was there that we might not have been seeing as white people. Um, for the folks, the Jewish kids who grew up to be Jewish parents to say, my kids are in the same schools that I went to in Bedford and they're experiencing the same kind of uh, um, anti-Semitic incidents and, and things that kids are saying in the playground that I did 40 years ago. So that implicated all of us in this silence that we had created about our nice community and we had to break through it. Um, some of that is just, you know, you have to live it. You have to live this experience as being a leader to, to know better. But some of it is these conversations and then taking back those conversations to your, your board, your fellow board members. There is no manual to be a select board member. I mean, we get training, we have opportunities to learn. It's not like there's nothing, but we don't, we don't get onboarded the way you would uh, in, you know, if you're going to Congress or something. And I don't know, as a rep, uh, Dr. Vea, I don't know if you get uh, <laughs> trained, um, but sometimes we just bring our own interests and our perspectives. And that's why it's so important for us to hear the, the lived experience of the people and to acknowledge it and say, look, we can still be a good community and face up to the ways in which we have failed each other in the past and try harder in the future. And um, that is a defensible posture that any leader should be comfortable taking, but you would be surprised how hard it is um, when people just don't want to acknowledge it. And that is the essence of um, white privilege, right? If you, if you don't experience it, it doesn't exist. So that, that's my, my short answer and I'm, I'm happy to talk more, but I do think those, that, that round table experience, uh, which was kind of that uh, more quasi private it wasn't a, a board, it wasn't a committee. It was sort of called together by our superintendent and our police chief and leaders in the community and clergy. And there were students present and there were parents present. And we met monthly for, I wanna say six months um, to have some of these conversations. Now, how do you sustain that going into the future? Um, it was more of a response. It was responding to those anti-Semitic incidents, but it was meaningful and it did allow people to be heard and allowed people of color to speak in ways where the town leadership could hear. So I hope that experience is helpful to share. Um, if I may, um, I, I just wanted to say first, first and foremost, thank you for having me. I too apologize for jumping on the call a little late. Um, my name is Maurice Edward Vincent. I'm superintendent of schools in Medford. I have two co colleagues on the call, Lisa Evangelista and Jody Liu. Um, but just as I was listening, many times I was uh, shaking my head because it is so hard sometimes to just hear all of the things that are still happening and you kind of wish you could take your magic wand and fix everything. But we know that that's not the reality. Um, in Medford, we just... Um, this year, in light of everything that has transpired, um, Medford has a history of situations that happened uh, 20, 30 years ago. And then with what just happened now, um, with all of the events involving Black Lives Matter, um, we had students kind of um, take to social media and talk about um, situations that they've experienced. And... Um, we started an anti-racist task force group in Medford. It's, we are in our first year and we have made a commitment to meeting. We meet every other week, but our goal is to try to truly shift the narrative um, using professional development, um, looking at curriculum and finding ways in which we can infuse cultural proficiency, greater inclusivity, um, less hate, and, and really um, educate everyone at the same time. It's not perfect, uh, 
But just listening to what's being said right now, I, I feel like now more than ever, the conversation, the conversation that we're having today, um, even though we don't have answers to all of the problems, the first step is talking about it, acknowledging it and saying, this is happening and we need to do something about it. And so I, I just was encouraged because I said, I know, you know, I'm not able to make 1000 sweeping changes because you need to give people an opportunity to kind of wrap their heads around what is going on. And so I would just wanna first, thank you DA Ryan and your team, but to encourage everyone to continue to have these conversations, you cannot force change if you want it to be sustainable. Yes, we can disrupt um, the way things are happening at a normal pace, but I truly do not wanna check the box in Medford and say, we had 3.7 conversations about race and snap our fingers. Medford is no longer um, racist. It's the happiest place to be. And there are no problems. Um, we know that it did not happen in a short period of time, that it was systemic and it's something that happened over years. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna take years to kind of shift the narrative and reverse what was happening through education, through partnering, I work very closely with my chief, Chief um, Jack Buckley, and you know, trying to work collaboratively to say we got to shift the narrative. Don't only let p police come into the school buildings in a negative capacity, but you know, they come in, they read to the kids, they have lunch breaks with the kids. We still do the Dare program and those kinds of things, but it's it's trying to shift the narrative. But I think the most important step is having conversations and calling it what it is. So we have an anti-racist task force. And so this meeting, anyone who came to this meeting knew based on the title, anti-hate, addressing micro microaggressions, anti-racist, that we're going to be having conversations, difficult conversations in order to bring us to that next level of greatness or the next level of good getting to better and eventually to get to best. And so I just wanted to um, thank you again for having me be part of this call, but to say that um, we are all in this together, whether we're here in Massachusetts or in other states, we have to, like everyone has to do their part. And it starts by us having these difficult conversations, honest conversations and thinking about how we can make change. So I wanna say thank you. Um, for that experience today. Thank all of you for, I know it's hard to clear this much time to have these conversations. Um, I think that we are really building some good partnerships here. I am, one of the saddest things about what happened in Belmont was the same evening, actually, as I was driving to Belmont, I was in the process of hiring our new director of our racial equity initiatives, um, who I look forward to having with us at our next meeting. So I am grateful, Robin, as I always am, and as I have especially been in the last two weeks for your help with this. I'm grateful to Chief McIsaac and to Kim for coming to talk about what's been happening in Belmont. And I appreciate all of you making time to be here. So thank you all very much. Stay well. <laughs>